Welcome to the closing chapter in our series on the border crisis. Now, part one covered the surge of migration to non-border state cities like New York and the impact that it's having on city services, agencies, and the migrants themselves. The second installment examined immigration from the political perspective of Latin American nations. So in this final chapter, we're gonna stay below the southern border to look at the economic factors that contribute to mass migration from Central and South American countries specifically. Now, we look at the root economic causes of migration, the U.S. failure to meaningfully partner with LAC nations to promote mutually beneficial economic conditions, and the expansion of China's Belt and Road, that's BRI initiative, in Latin America, and the geopolitical impact that it's having on our relationships. UNFTR. So apologies in advance for the dense nature of this format. There's a lot to get to, so it's a little light on graphics and clips and a little heavy on the essay format. So I'm sure my voice is gonna get a bit tedious. Hopefully you can bear with me. Also note that this is an abbreviated version of a longer podcast and an essay that you can find online at unftr.com. There you'll find a link to the entire series and a comprehensive list of sources and resources and a glossary of key terms. Remember to subscribe to our weekly newsletter and check out all of the resources on our website from original news stories, weekly spotlights of progressives making a difference, a directory of progressive resources, and so much more. Just go to unftr.com for all of this and information on how you can become a member of the show. Sometimes it feels like the only economies in the world that matter are the US and China. At least that feels like the dominant narrative on mainstream news and business reporting outlets. Now in fairness, US GDP at the close of 2023 was around 27 trillion and China was 17 trillion. After that, the drop is substantial. To give you an idea of scale, the entire LAC region, again, that's Latin America and the Caribbean, is somewhere in the neighborhood of six and a half trillion. Last month, the World Bank released a comprehensive report on the LAC region that benchmarks its performance against other economies and speaks to some of the institutional challenges it faces post-COVID. Broadly, it shows that the LAC has recovered lost GDP since the pandemic, but the overall recovery has been much slower than many other economies. It's important to note that when we look at the economic figures of the LAC in totality, Brazil and Mexico have a tendency to influence the figures just due to their size and scale of populations and economies. For example, poverty has worsened since the pandemic in most LAC nations, but as a whole, it improved because Mexico and Brazil have managed poverty programs better than their peers. This is especially true in Brazil, where Lula da Silva has reinstated the Bolsa Familia suite of public welfare programs that were a hallmark of his original tenure. In Mexico, there was an increase in earnings and labor participation, which helped bolster the lower end of the economic spectrum. The report details some of the structural differences between LAC economies and maybe what we're used to in the US and China by comparison. As much as the United States has seen its share of massive consolidation and giant companies, especially in the tech sector, uh, protein manufacturing industry, the airline industry, and media, for example, and the PRC is a dominant factor in central planning, Latin American industries are rife with large combinations and oligarchies that exercise control over economic and political decisions. For example, the World Bank report specifically calls out the writ of Amparo, which was designed to protect individual constitutional rights and really has no analogous feature in common law for us to compare. The report isolates Amparo because powerful corporations have been using it for their benefit to tie up antitrust rulings. The practice is suddenly so widespread that consulting firms specializing in defending conglomerates are popping up all over Latin America. So I suppose that we could liken it to maybe the impact of Citizens United in the US, right? So protecting corporate speech as a civil liberty, that's the closest comparison I can find. But this highlights one of the biggest issues that pervades governance in the LAC. Special interest corporations have a far greater impact in the LAC than other parts of the world, which has made many countries prone to systemic corruption. And this corruption is expressed in different ways throughout the region. Ecuador, for example, has been infiltrated by international drug cartels, most notably from Albania. Few LAC countries in the 20th century escaped the corrupt labor and environmental practices of large corporations, such as the notorious United Fruit Company, one of the most ruthless monopolies in history. In Mexico, there's a delicate dance between tycoons like Carlos Slim, 
the powerful drug cartels, administrative state, and increasing influence of the Mexican military over civilian affairs. And then there's the hundred year miss on the part of the United States to fully appreciate and recognize the potential of the Latin American economies and natural resources on our own economy. Interventions, punitive tariffs, expensive Wall Street loans, land acquisition, resource extraction with little attention paid to labor practices or environmental concerns, all the way to outright coups. These are the hallmarks of the imperial and paternalistic relationship between the U.S. and the LAC. Looking back, it seems so obvious that a coordinated regional and hemispheric attempt to build mature and fair trade relationships would have inured to the benefit of both the U.S. and Latin America. Instead, we largely ignored it and built a Rube Goldberg network of economic relationships constructed around false foreign policy narratives, racialized worldviews, and exploitation. Now, much of the focus of this piece is on Central and South America, leaving the Caribbean nations to the side. From an economic standpoint, the contributions of the Caribbean nations to trade tend to be small and narrow. So let's zoom out to examine the economic characteristics of some of the larger Latin American nations to understand exactly where they fit into the global economic portrait. Iron ore, beef, and soybeans from Brazil. Corn, wheat, and beef from Argentina. Chile's copper, avocados, and wine. Automobile parts and machinery from Mexico. Colombian coffee and coal. Gold, copper, and zinc from Peru. Semiconductors from Costa Rica, and lithium from Bolivia. Latin America is a source of abundance with its own dynamic and complex architecture that are challenged by systemic corruption and the influence of unchecked conglomerates. These circumstances have been exacerbated by U.S. attitudes toward Latin America as a whole, seeing it as some underdeveloped region that exists to exploit rather than partner with. When we think about economic policies and circumstances that factor into the root causes of migration, there are a few obvious ones. Now, we can argue about causation versus correlation, but there's a serious discussion to be had about the impact of U.S. foreign policy and trade policy in the Americas. How much did NAFTA contribute to inequality in Mexico, for example? What are the long-term consequences of U.S. sanctions against the Chavez and now Maduro regimes in Venezuela? Our obsession with Cuba since the 1959 revolution. Why did we pursue industrial relationships with China all the way across the world instead of fostering them closer to home? Did our interventions into the elections in, I don't know, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Bolivia, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Panama, and Nicaragua create permanent barriers to building a comprehensive industrial and trade policy throughout Latin America? The best part is the fun names that we come up with, like Operations Mongoose and Zapata, Cuba, 1961. Operation Power Pack, Dominican Republic, 1965. Operation Urgent Fury, Grenada, 1983. Operation Blast Furnace, Bolivia, 1986. Operation Just Cause, Panama, 1989. Operation Uphold Democracy, Haiti, 1994. Operation Secure Tomorrow, also Haiti, 2004. That's just a smattering of the interventions, funded guerrilla operations, and outright coups that we've carried out or participated in over the years. Of course, we can't ignore the original 9-11 when we overthrew the socialist Allende regime in Chile in 1973 and ushered in a dictatorship under Pinochet. Point being, whether it's through economic warfare or outright war, U.S. neoliberal policies have contributed to economic outflows and destabilization in developing nations throughout the world. We come, we see, we extract. Carol Wise, a professor of international relations at the University of Southern California, recently published a book titled Dragonomics, How Latin America is Maximizing, or Missing Out on, China's International Development Strategy. In it, she examines the impact of Chinese investments into the LAC and how this relationship has begun to transform the economic outlook for several nations, albeit to varying degrees. It's fascinating to think that the United States has ceded this territory to the PRC considering the basic geography. But as Wise notes, quote, not only would there be no equivalent of the Marshall Plan for Latin America, but also, from the early 1950s on, U.S. attention toward the LAC region would turn narrowly on the imperative to block the spread of communism 
to the Western Hemisphere." End quote. The intense myopia of the U.S. Cold War foreign policy essentially turned the entire LAC into a giant economic blind spot for the United States, with the possible exception of NAFTA, although that's North America, and the reimagined version under Trump, the USMCA. For a deeper dive on this, we actually did an episode titled The Washington Consensus, a series of policy positions toward Latin America, so go check that out if you're interested. Essentially, much in the way that the IMF has been criticized for promoting social austerity programs in return for debt service, U.S. economic policy has been deeply intertwined with our foreign policy, which is to say that we basically impose our will through bilateral agreements to extract the resources that we need preferably through the auspices of multinational corporations. And if we don't get what we want, we simply look elsewhere. While there are ongoing efforts to create a unified trade and tariff architecture to streamline economic growth as a region, most of the LAC nations still operate on bilateral agreements and are subject to convulsions depending upon the political regimes in power. Thus, many of the major economies relied heavily on their primary natural resources such as fossil fuels, agricultural products, and minerals. Sole-sourced economic models such as these develop in a paradoxical fashion that are extremely price-sensitive. For example, oil-rich Venezuela has thus far failed to develop a diverse economy that might otherwise insulate it from commodity price shocks. This is what economists refer to as the resource curse. Now, corollary to this phenomenon is often called the Dutch disease, though there's a slight difference between the two. The concept of resource curse usually extends to formerly colonized countries that were unable to develop holistically and independently, with much of the gain from commodity extraction going to a small fraction of elites in the home country and to the economic benefit of the colonizing forces that extract them. This results in a fragile nation-state almost exclusively reliant on the whims of both the colonizers and the elites that run the country. Dutch disease is similar in that an extreme focus on a single commodity within an underdeveloped economic and political structure robs other industries from much-needed attention, regulation, and investments required to foster growth. For example, pouring resources into just extracting fossil fuels robs the manufacturing and agricultural sectors of capital and attention. Now, in both cases, when commodity prices, which are global and out of control of the producing countries, experience negative volatility, it has a drag on the entire economy and all the functioning tributaries that flow from such activities, such as uh, social services and education and other sectors that rely on revenues and taxes generated by the primary activities. The paternalistic and colonizing attitude inherent in U.S. foreign policy, both political and economic, means that we haven't been as much of a productive and consistent partner as we could have been in building the necessary infrastructure to promote positive trade. Now, one nation that understood this and deliberately took advantage and is still taking advantage of this attitude is China. 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 You take China. 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 The PRC's interest in the LAC predates Xi Jinping's Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, launched in 2013, which usually garners the most attention. According to the Council on Foreign Relations, the BRI is, quote, a collection of development and investment initiatives originally devised to link East Asia and Europe through physical infrastructure. In the decades since, the project has expanded to Africa, Oceania, and Latin America, significantly broadening China's economic and political influence, end quote. So there are recent eye-catching investment projects that have begun to worry the U.S. State Department and put foreign policy hawks on the defensive, manifesting in the anti-China rhetoric that we see today. Infrastructure investments under the BRI sometimes take the shape of classic infrastructure projects like bridges, tunnels, and roads, but often they facilitate transformational energy and mining projects. Now, dollars in debt and bridges and roads is one thing. Natural resources and fossil fuels is another entirely if you're looking to get the attention of policymakers in the United States. So it's important to understand the economic arrangement between China and the LAC because it further clarifies how inept the United States has been for 100 plus years in fostering authentic partnerships in Latin America. In fact, Chinese investments into Latin America is so long-standing that it's beginning to cool off. As Carol Wise writes, 
Quote, as the process of deepening China-LAC relations has now entered its third decade, outflows of Chinese FDI, foreign direct investment, to the region have leveled off. Some of this leveling is due to China's own slowing growth, but also due to its weak record of due diligence. Environmental transgressions, conflicts with local communities, and numerous allegations of old-fashioned corruption have also caught up with Chinese investors. End quote. So China's experience hasn't all been wine and roses. But it's fascinating that the United States has only recently awakened to the reality that our supposed primary competitor on the other side of the world has been investing heavily into neighboring countries right under our noses for three decades. Reading State Department position papers, one might have the impression that China has suddenly invaded our territory and is acting nefariously and with ideological motives. Another example that we're incapable of breaking from the Cold War mindset. In fact, China appears to have very little interest in fanning ideological flames when it comes to their investments. And this goes back quite some time, actually. Again, as Wise notes, quote, when a homegrown Maoist guerrilla insurgency openly launched its own people's war in Peru in 1980, Beijing wanted nothing to do with it, end quote. And more recently, Wise writes, Quote, the bottom line is that China has brokered loans for oil deals with Ecuador and Venezuela, but does not intend to spend political capital in support of their anti-U.S. follies, end quote. So there's a couple of important concepts related to Chinese involvement in Latin America to unpack before we close with a conversation about immigration specifically. First off, China does not have a one-size-fits-all approach to investing in Latin America. Sometimes they come to the table with low interest rate loans that have fewer strings attached than the ones offered by the IMF. That's made China kind of a de facto global infrastructure development bank. Other times, they're investing into physical infrastructure projects directly that lean heavily on imported Chinese labor, which is a double-edged sword for their partners, but at least the money flows. The one thing every investment shares in common, however, is the requirement that the partner nation recognize China 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 over Taiwan. That's the price of admission that all must pay to do business with the PRC. Some of the more stable nations such as Chile, Costa Rica and Peru have worked diligently to reform and regulate the capital markets and streamline trade agreements, tariffs, uh, labor protections, environmental regulations and intellectual property rights essentially modernizing their economic systems and aligning them with the expectations of the U.S. and China. Wise and other observers note that the one thing that separates Costa Rica from the rest of Latin America is its insistence on the highest environmental standards. So I thought that was cool and worth noting. Now, ironically, the country with the most potential upside that hasn't been able to capitalize on FDI from China and an extremely close relationship and proximity to the United States is Mexico. Now, in fairness to the latter, NAFTA and the USMCA were extremely favorable to U.S. corporations, obviously. So the former, however, is a bit of a head scratcher. Despite the proximity to the largest consumer base on the planet, Mexico somehow allowed China to crowd out Mexican exports. Wise attributes this to China's massive investment into technology in its manufacturing sector. Essentially, NAFTA should have could have been a clear victory given the inflow of investment and desire among U.S. corporations to exploit Mexican labor. But it failed to scaffold the opportunity through public policy and simply allowed the U.S. corporations and Mexican oligarchs to line their pockets. Mexico has a center-left administration under Obrador, and it's likely going to continue this way in the upcoming election under Claudia Scheinbaum, who's leading in the polls. It also has the largest inflow of migrants into the United States. Venezuela exists under the autocratic rule of Maduro and has forced hundreds of thousands of Venezuelans to flee to Colombia, the United States, and other locales. Ecuador, Nicaragua, and Peru, mostly conservative. Guatemala, Colombia, and Honduras, considered liberal. Point being, there's no direct correlation between political ideology and migration, broadly speaking. Climate change, however, is certainly having an impact on migratory patterns throughout the world, and Latin America is no exception. Climate change is indiscriminate, and many of the Latin American and Caribbean countries are precariously positioned to receive the brunt of severe changes in weather patterns and extreme conditions. And then there's violence. The World Bank provides the most comprehensive economic analysis of the LAC each year in a report referred to as the LACER report. 
That stands for Latin America and the Caribbean Economic Review. The most recent LACER reveals that the region is the most violent in the world, driven by the illicit narcotics trade. The report also cites tax policy, the cost of capital, poorly educated workforce, and immature infrastructure as major reasons that nearshoring, i.e. partnership with the U.S. manufacturing sector, hasn't produced the type of growth that China experienced over the past three decades. Regardless of political ideology, myriad structural economic factors plague the LAC and have prevented it from fully recognizing the potential of its vast natural resources and labor pool. These conditions have made it susceptible to a level of violence and corruption that forces populations to uproot and move. Now, it's never just as simple as the headlines make it out to be. And the United States is largely, but not entirely, to blame for this phenomenon. Latin American nations went from colonial properties to independent states gradually over two centuries, only to wind up back in a neo-colonial economic trap called neoliberalism. But let's take a step back from our clinical diagnosis of economic conditions to take a wider view. Latin America failed to follow the global capitalist model example set by the United States and Western Europe. And it's too segmented to have crafted a centralized planning model like we see in China. So let me be extremely clear about this point. Just because the LAC failed to follow the liberal trade rules established, then abandoned by the US and Western Europe, doesn't mean it failed. Nor does it suggest that it's somehow separate and apart from the capitalist model. It just hasn't fit the capitalist oppressor mode. Recall Rosa Luxemburg's keen economic observation about Marx's capital model. See, Marx hypothesized that if labor was the central ingredient in creating the exchange value of a commodity, then displacement of workers due to industrialization would therefore reduce profitability for owners and drive power into the hands of workers. Now, Luxembourg, however, foresaw capitalist imperialism. She understood that capitalists would forever pursue cheap labor and thus partner with nation states to exploit global labor through corporate colonialism. And she was right. In this way, Latin America has been the perfect partner for U.S. and now Chinese capitalist tendencies. Climate change, violence, repression and instability have contributed to excessive immigration. They're also the natural and necessary byproducts of capitalism. The influx of migrants under the streets of New York City that we covered in part one are refugees of capitalism. In part two, we spoke of the workers in Mexico who flee violence and financial hardship. They're all refugees of capitalism. The poverty-stricken families that try to escape the cartels in Ecuador, the state-sponsored violence in Venezuela, or gang violence in Honduras. These are refugees of capitalism. The World Bank, the IMF, the US Congress, Biden and Trump administrations, the European Union, and the PRC would all have you believe that the answer lies in the free markets. And they're right to the extent that it could work for countries like Brazil, Argentina, Mexico. They're big enough to open the markets to the corporate class and pursue the buzzwords of the Washington consensus in their own right. But it would be at the expense of other nations as Luxembourg so rightly predicted. And in doing so, it will shift the refugee and asylum seeking crisis to other parts of Latin America and the world because that is what capitalism demands. Perhaps the conditions are indeed ripe for an economic revolution in Latin America. It's just not the market revolution the global institutions insist upon. The resources required to transform the global economy and energy infrastructure are beneath the feet of Brazilians and Bolivians. Costa Rica has developed a high-tech sector while maintaining its environmental protection standards. Put another way, a social democracy, democratic socialist state, and environmental beacon are lighting the way. There's no immigration crisis tied to these nations that put people and planet before profit. Here endeth the lesson, and here endeth the series.